Um, hello, everyone. I am Dario from the virtualization team. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to see this talk, uh, which is from me and from me, from uh, um, Suppliance team, uh, which is going to be about uh, virtualization and performance of virtual machine that uh, we want them to be fast, basically. So let's say something uh, about uh, yeah what uh, usually happens when uh, you want to do some performance evaluation in virtualization so you have a benchmark uh, as usual for everything performance related the benchmark could be uh, one or more benchmark actually but even the benchmark itself uh, can be uh, composed maybe by multiple tests or sub benchmark which is this case by the way then, um, as I'm going to say again, we are in virtualization domain, so uh, you run uh, your benchmark and your virtual machine, but you also can run your benchmark on bare metal. And uh, for example, you may want to compare the performance. In fact, uh, this is, um, again, a quite common uh, situation, a quite common way to tell, for example, whether uh, uh, your virtual machine is really configured for uh, top speed. Uh, so you, conf you, you compare the results of uh, the workload of interest, the benchmark of interest, uh, um, between bare metal and virtual machine, and you check whether they are similar enough. Where similar enough can be just similar enough, or can be also something uh, uh, defined more formally, which again is uh, uh, the case of this, uh, of this presentation. In fact, um, this talk is a report of an activity that uh, has been ongoing uh, by a few people, uh, me, Lee, but also uh, others, uh, uh, about uh, running uh, uh, some uh, benchmarks of interest, uh, which uh, for the case of the ones that uh, I'm going to talk about uh, more in this presentation are uh, two. One uh, is... Uh, um, CPU and memory intensive uh, kind of workload, and uh, the second is uh, uh, more uh, I.O. and more specifically network uh, intensive workload. So we have these benchmarks. Uh, they are uh, composed by a number of sub of tests, let's call them like that. Uh, and if we run all these benchmarks, we get results from all these tests on bare metal. We, get, we do the same in, uh, in the uh, virtual machine. Then we can compute the uh, performance decline, which is simply a difference, uh, VM uh, minus VM. And we call it a decline because we usually expect uh, the virtual machine to be a little bit slower and so there to be an actual performance decline due to the overhead added by the virtualization layer. And uh, yeah, exactly, so this, uh, this is the one of the metrics that we are going to um, considering the presentation, the performance decline between VM, uh, VM and VM, uh, VM and VM, so virtual machine versus per metal, uh, then the same, but uh, in uh, percent, uh, so the percent decline between uh, um, bare metal and virtual machine. And then, as I was saying, uh, let's define some uh, more concrete goals uh, for the part uh, uh, where we said that the VM has to be as fast as possible or to perform as similar as possible to bare metal. So let's say that we care about uh, the average performance um, percentage decline. Uh, meaning that, as we said, uh, our benchmark are uh, made out of uh, a number of uh, a number of uh, tests uh, or sub benchmarks. We compute the percent decline of each one, and then we do the average. And this tells us uh, uh, overall uh, uh, what the uh, performance are for the uh, for the benchmark as a whole, as, as I was saying, and. Uh, yeah, usually you want these uh, average performance decline, uh, average percentage decline, sorry, to be uh, lower than a certain threshold, which uh, let's say for us it could be uh, 10%, but again, it's, uh, it's an example. Uh, now, mm, average is good, but uh, it might not tell much or uh, maybe enough. Uh, 
about uh, how the uh, each and, and every of the single uh, uh, tests that are part of the benchmark went. Uh, the things might, I mean, things might be very, might be very good on average, but then you may have uh, some of the tests which are uh, really good, some others which are really bad, and uh, uh, you also want to uh, usually you also want to uh, control that. So, for example, another metric that you could consider is uh, compute the percentiles of uh, the uh, various runs of, of the various uh, tests that are part of the benchmark. And then uh, typically you have as a requirement or you set yourself uh, the requirement that some high percentile uh, is uh, also uh, must also be uh, smaller than uh, a certain threshold. So, for example, if you say that 90, the 90 percentile uh, has to be below 10 percent, what you uh, are asking is that uh, the 90 percent of the tests that are part of the benchmark uh, cannot be slower than 10 percent when, uh, when the results are compared with uh, their metal. Uh, there is a question about is VM benchmarks running exactly on the same machine? Yes, I will come to this. Uh, in, in a moment, but uh, uh, yes, basically. So yeah, the last uh, thing that I want to mention is that uh, even if you uh, have this requirement or impose yourself this uh, requirement about, uh, let's say, 90% or 80% or 95%, whatever, which tells you a lot more than just average um, about how the performance is, is uh, um, inside the VM, uh, then what about the, 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 the rest 10% of the, of the tests? Then um, this is something that you also can be interested about. So, okay, 90% of them are behaving fine, but uh, there might be outliers. Can these outliers run wild and performance be as bad as uh, we get them? Well, maybe, uh, or maybe not, maybe you may also have a requirement that uh, the uh, maximum performance decline among all the tests, uh, all the benchmarks, or all the tests that compose your, benchmark, your benchmarks uh, uh, to also be uh, limited, uh, capped uh, at, for example, 50% or something. And so this is kind of uh, uh, works both as a generic introduction, uh, introduction uh, to performance benchmarking in virtual machine where you want to compare their uh, metal and VM. And it's also similar to what we uh, had to do for this uh, uh, project. So yeah, a little bit uh, more, just a little bit more of details uh, of uh, this actual case. Um, configuration, configuration was uh, a rather big server. So a Xeon processor with 224 CPUs in four sockets and three terabytes of memory. And uh, yeah, that's what I uh, was saying before when I, when I, was saying, when I said that uh, I will um, cover where the benchmark ran. Uh, and and uh, yeah, we ran the benchmark on bare metal with this configuration. And then we ran the benchmark inside one single VM, uh, at least for now, running on this uh, uh, server and uh, configured with uh, 224 CPUs and uh, uh, 2.7 terabytes of memory. In both cases, the operating system was, was uh, Lee 15 SP2. Uh, of course, on the host, uh, the operating system was, 50, was Lee 15 SP2. When we run the benchmark in the virtualization, both the host operating system is uh, Lee 15 SP2 and the guest operating system is uh, the C15 MC2 again. And uh, yeah, the workload, uh, this, basically, uh, this is basically what I said uh, already. Two benchmarks, uh, each one with a lot of uh, sub-tests of sub-benchmarks. Uh, benchmark one was CPU and memory intensive, and uh, the other one was I.O. and uh, more uh, specifically network. So the starting situation, for what I mean with starting situation is just uh, we create the VM, uh, start it, run the benchmark inside it, uh, measure, me measure the performance, what do we get as a decline between uh, uh, the metal and VM. Uh, right, we have many numbers in this presentation. I am showing a, a, a part of, the, part of, of uh, all, we, all that we collected. And um, 
Yeah, on average, uh, as a starting situation, we were seeing a rather big uh, decline, uh, around 30%. Then these are the percentiles. Uh, and this is something that you can also appreciate from uh, looking at this graph. So basically, there were quite a few of the tests which are part of this benchmark. This is the CPU and memory intensive one. Uh, uh, are uh, in the order of uh, performance declines around 20, 30, 40. A lot of them uh, were around 40%, but even a little bit more. 90% of them were within a 48% uh, performance decline as compared to bare metal. And uh, uh, there were two, some outliers, you see them here, here, and here, uh, which were uh, really running wild until uh, even 227% uh, worst. So, yeah, starting situation is uh, not so good, I would say. We would really like to improve, um, and uh, that's how we try to do it. So we try to do some tuning, basically. And tuning, uh, the first form of tuning that one should always think of, in my opinion, when dealing with virtualization is uh, resource partitioning. It's not guaranteed that you can do that all the time. So it depends on the configuration, depends on whether you have uh, over commit, depends on a number of things. But uh, if you can do some uh, uh, partitioning static or semi-static partitioning of the host resources and uh, then do the assignment of these uh, um, host resources to your virtual machine or virtual machines if you have more than one. Uh, that would limit a lot the, the overhead, the interference, and is uh, likely to provide uh, the best performance possible. This, of course, is a very general statement. Yeah, we have to uh, deal with each single case, uh, but it was uh, something that we that we could do in our case because, as I said, uh, we had only one uh, only one VM at least for now. And uh, and what I mean by uh, resource partitioning is uh, basically pretty uh, standard and straightforward techniques. Uh, I think. Uh, which is uh, CPU pinning, uh, virtual CPU pinning on the physical CPUs of the the host of the server. Uh, for memory, we don't want to uh, overcommit the memory of the, of the host. And for IO devices, uh, uh, there are a few mechanisms that you can use uh, for uh, doing direct device assignment uh, of IO devices on the, of the host to the, to the VM. But this is the ideas. Uh, let's cover some of these aspects in uh, a little bit more details. So, yeah, first of all, the size of the VM. I said already that the VM was um, 20, um, 200, sorry, and 24 CPUs and 2.7 terabytes of memory. So the VM had, had uh, the same number of virtual CPUs than the host as physical CPUs, and it had almost all the memory. So memory, uh, the host has 3 terabytes, the VM has 2.7. Uh, we need we, we need basically to leave some uh, uh, memory to the host and the hypervisor, and uh, we decided to leave uh, uh, roughly five percent, or I mean, in general, to use two point seven terabytes out of three for the VM. Did I mention that the hypervisor work VM? I'm not sure I did. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure I put it in the slide. Well, I am doing now. The hypervisor is KVM in this case. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, as far as virtual CPUs goes, um, it's quite typical to uh, leave some of the uh, CPUs of the host to the host instead than uh, using all of them for the virtual machine. So for example, a typical configuration and a configuration which we actually uh, looked into in our uh, investigations uh, either is uh, uh, that, for example, you leave one core per socket uh, uh, for uh, host activities uh, or even for uh, work for the I.O. activities of the, of the VM itself uh, so that they can be carried on uh, without interfering too much with the actual vCPUs of the VM running the workload inside the VM. 
this would mean that our VM uh, uh, would use 216 vCPUs instead than 224. Or, on the other end, you can do what we end up doing, what we ended up doing, which is using uh, all, the VC all the CPUs and assigning the VM uh, 224 virtual CPUs. This means uh, that there is some room for um, interference uh, between uh, whatever is going on on the host uh, and uh, the virtual CPUs of the VM. We, as I said, uh, tried both uh, and uh, we measured the difference and uh, I have a slide, a slide about that uh, later. So for now, just uh, let, uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, this is the configuration that, the configuration that uh, uh, proved to be, at least for this workload, uh, the most, uh, the better one, the, the, the most performant one. And so we are going for it. Um, yeah, physical, in the, as, as I said, CPU pinning. Um, now we have, uh, we know that we have 224 virtual CPUs. Uh, I said that we want to do uh, resource partitioning, that we want to limit the, um, overhead and for example a way to limit the scheduling overhead at the host level is to pin the virtual cpus to the physical cpus if we do that then uh, your virtual cpus won't move uh, outside of the uh, physical cpus or physical cpus that you have chosen for it and again a quite typical pinning strategies is this one uh, strategy sorry is this one on the left where each vcpu is assigned to one uh, physical CPU, but uh, again, we measured uh, uh, the performance of both these configurations, uh, uh, this uh, other one on the right being uh, slightly different, where each virtual CPU is assigned to two, two physical CPUs, uh, which, uh, uh, by the way, are uh, the two threads that uh, are part of uh, um, core. And uh, these, they, they, they were very similar. Uh, the results that we got, that we got uh, were very similar. Uh, this one was slightly better, so we kept it. And uh, yeah, for memory, uh, we don't want overcommit, as I said. Uh, so no, 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 not any kind of overcommit. So for example, uh, not only we don't want the VM to have more memory than there is on the host, that's uh, uh, quite uh, easy to. Uh, to, 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 to realize that uh, we don't want that, I guess. But we also, for example, don't want to use ballooning, so the VM had all the memory um, since the beginning. We don't want uh, swap, uh, so pages of the uh, memory of the VM to be swapped in and swapped out. Uh, we want huge pages, either transparent huge pages or uh, uh, huge pages pre-allocated pre at boot uh, uh, and uh, use huge BFS. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, and we, I mean, transparent huge pages went, gave uh, decent results, uh, but uh, of course, uh, pre allocating huge pages as boot was uh, even better. And since uh, again, we are doing starting partitioning, uh, it's uh, something that we can do in this, uh, in this case, and so we went for it. Uh, and uh, yeah, for having all the pages locked in memory, you usually do something like this uh, uh, with locked and divert, uh, but there is no need to do it if you use uh, one gigabyte huge pages from uh, UCTLBFS. So, uh, which in order to be able to do that, you basically uh, alter your uh, host um, kernel command line uh, like this, uh, reserving the huge pages, and then you tell uh, libvirt to use uh, those uh, huge pages like this. And you don't want page sharing. There is not much to share. There's only one VM. Um, so we turn off uh, KSM. Uh, physical and virtual topology, since we have done uh, the static resource partitioning, the pinning, uh, we also want to take advantage uh, to uh, of the uh, topology of the server, even when we are running inside the VM. And uh, we do that after having done uh, CPU pinning in a sensible way, then uh, we can uh, take advantage of that uh, by defining uh, a virtual topology for the VM. The virtual topology has to match the one, uh, the physical topology, so the one of the host. So for socket 28 cores, uh, two threads, it was the same that uh, our uh, CPU on the server has. And um, you can uh, also define the virtual NUMA topology, defining the virtual nodes uh, 
and specifying which CPUs uh, uh, are uh, part of uh, each uh, uh, virtual node. And on a recent enough libvirt, and we have it in uh, in uh, the uh, 15 sp 2 you can also define the distances uh, between the virtual nodes. Uh, too much, of course, uh, the physical ones again. Then uh, again, pretty much the same for uh, memory from a NUMA point of view. So basically, you want, for example, uh, that uh, the memory uh, for each physical NUMA node, so the memory that for a physical num virtual NUMA node zero so is allocated on physical NUMA node zero, and so on and so forth for uh, all the uh, others, uh, other nodes. And that, that's how you do it uh, in libvirt. About automatic NUMA balancing, we certainly don't want it at the host level because, again, we are statically partitioning uh, pretty much everything, so we disable it. Inside the VM, you can use it if you want. Uh, for our workload, uh, it's disabled uh, because it's the recommendation of the workload itself. But uh, uh, once you have configured your VM, uh, like uh, I have shown you so far, uh, a NUMAware workload uh, running inside it, which would benefit from uh, Automatic NUMA balancing can actually uh, use it and enable it if, uh, if you want. So I'm going quickly to a question. Can those values be read from the host automatically by VIRT manager or LibVirt? Uh, which values? Uh, I believe the NUMA topology ones, so, so the partitioning and the NUMA distances and stuff like that. Uh, you can... Uh, uh, you see this from libvirt. We, the, the, there are virsh commands which tell you the characteristic of the hosts, uh, uh, including the, the NUMA distances, the number of NUMA nodes, and stuff like that. Not so much virt manager as far as I, as far as I know. Or otherwise you... I'm not sure if I understood the question. Perhaps uh, I go on and uh, then um, if I didn't answer it properly, we go back to, to the question Hi, uh, itself later. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so basically, yeah. I meant, is it possible to do most of this work or as much as possible automatically rather than having to, you know, go parse the values manually, possibly do it in an error-prone way and then configure the machine? Okay, uh, now I understood the question a lot better, and it's even uh, a lot easier to answer. To answer, no, <laughs> uh, not really, uh, not with Virsh, uh, not with Virt Manager, and not even uh, with uh, more advanced tools. Uh, so everyone, uh, at least as far as I've seen, uh, there has uh, uh, scripts uh, or uh, whatever manual or semi-manual tool for uh, for doing that it's uh it's something that would be really uh interesting and useful to have but uh, there, there aren't much solution that i'm aware of uh, for doing that so okay io devices i mentioned that we also want to do some uh, um, yeah, something about them and uh, device assign. I mentioned device assignment, uh, and uh, since one of our benchmark is I/O intensive and more specifically network intensive, we uh, did see uh, did see uh, good results from um, assigning directly to the VM the network card, uh, and we tried both SRIOV and PCI pass-through. With SRIOV, we achieved uh, decent networking performance, let's say. With PCI pass-through, we achieved uh, a rather weird behavior, and uh, I'm either worse or, uh, well, definitely less um, stable performance. And uh, I, we haven't been able to do to investigate it uh, as much as I wanted yet. Uh, I hope to be able to do so at some point. I have a couple of other slides in the future, but uh, uh, just to say that uh, the uh, chosen configuration is SRIOV. And for disks, uh, it was a lot less uh, critical as an IO resource, and so uh, just uh, attaching the um, storage device uh, as a virtual block device uh, uh, was enough. Uh, we discovered a nice or yeah, something that uh, uh, 
wasn't uh, perhaps obvious, at least, at least not to me uh, at the beginning, that uh, the caching attribute had uh, quite a bit uh, of an impact on the performance, uh, considering that, yes, the benchmark uses disk, but not so much. So. Uh, but again, I have uh, some numbers later. Um, some special features. So basically, there are uh, quite a few uh, features in uh, Linux and in KVM uh, to deal with uh, a situation which, for example, is typical, is typical with um, spin logs, but not only, not only there, but it's a perfect example. So basically, with spin logs, you can have uh, CPUs that uh, own the lock, that, uh, a CPU that owns the lock, and uh, some other CPUs that spin. Uh, if you are on bare metal, then uh, they actually spin, and, they act, and the CPU that owns the lock uh, do whatever it has to do with uh, inside the critical section. If you are in virtualization, the CPU that owns the lock can be preempted, for example, can be not running, and you have a bunch of you may have a bunch of other uh, tasks as they are seen on the host uh, that are spinning on something which is not running, which is not ideal. Again, it's not uh, ideal for performance of the host. It's not even ideal for the VM because it's not how Spindock are supposed to work when they were designing and someone decided to, decided to use a Spindock for some critical section. So there are some special features in KVM. This one called PLA, PLE, sorry, uh, also uh, takes, advantage, takes advantage of some hardware capabilities uh, for avoiding this situation, basically, for preventing this situation to happen. Uh, so it's usually good to have it and to leave it enabled. However, in our case, we are the vCPUs which are pinned to the physical CPUs. They are kind of, uh, each it's, the situation is kind of that uh, each virtual CPU has a physical CPU uh, dedicated to it. Uh, so um, we are much more close to what how things look on bare metal, and so, for example, we don't need this feature and we disable it. And that's uh, and and sorry, yeah. Uh, when in the slides, when you see these boxes, is how you actually do what I what the slide says and what I try to to explain. So this is how you disable it, or at least one way to disable it. Uh, same for uh, Parabirtual TLB flashing and for, uh, uh, again, <laughs> Parabirtual spin locks. Uh, TLB flashing is another operation which on uh, requires uh, doing something and then having some spinning on, on others. And uh, in virtual, there are KVM optimization that uh, uh, take care of uh, uh, making sure that this spinning only happens if uh, uh, the once you are waiting for uh, a running. But again, we don't we don't need that if we do static partitioning and CPU pinning. And the same again for spin logs, even uh, with independently from uh, from uh, PLE, but from a um, spin lock implementation point of view. And so again, we can disable all these optimizations, and uh, we do that uh, uh, like this. It's also a not a rather new feature of both uh, Linux and KVM and uh, uh, Libvert as well. Not super new, one year ago, something like that. Uh, it is what is when it was uh, introduced. And uh, yeah, if you specify uh, this um, basically this block in the XML config file of the VM, you disable these uh, optimizations. And uh, yeah, power management. Power management, of course, is relevant only at the host level, and there we want to avoid going too deep into uh, high power seven states because that's bad for latency, and uh, we do that by restricting to C1 the C states. So inside the VM, of course, there is no power management, but there is something which is, uh, or at least uh, has been implemented to be. Uh, similar to that, uh, it's uh, uh, again a new feature. Uh, it's merged in uh, 5.4 kernel, if I remember correctly, but we have it in uh, Z15SP2 because it has been backported. It's called uh, CPU Idle Alt Pool, it's implemented as a CPU Idle Governor, and uh, it basically deals with the situation which uh, uh, what happens when a virtual CPU of the virtual machine calls an HLT instruction. Uh, which usually is that uh, we exit the virtual machine and then we are in the, in the end of the host. Uh, but with this governor, if you enable this in the, inside the guest, then instead of exiting immediately, the vCPU pulls for a little. And uh, if it turns out that uh, there is a valid wake up 
quickly enough, then the work of the execution restarts immediately inside the vCPU itself, and we have saved not only blocking scheduling, wake up and scheduling, which is what we save if we pull, so if you do the same, but at the host level, but also the VM exit and VM enter uh, by doing uh, the, this polling inside the, inside the guest. And this is also, I have numbers about it, this is also proved very, very um, interesting, for, to, to be very, very interesting for the performance point of view, at least for our workload. And yeah, and this is how you do it. Uh, inside the guest this time, you just load the uh, model of the governor, and you can even tweak the um, polling interval uh, by yeah, passing it some parameters. Uh, vulnerability mitigations. This is the configuration that we ended up uh, um, speculative execution vulnerability mitigations. I mean, uh, of course, as you know, uh, they eat a lot of performance uh, in general, uh, then some, some do that more, some do that less. So for most, in general, it depends a lot on the workload. And um, in our case, uh, we ended up uh, keeping uh, everything, each one of them, let's say, enabled at the host level, except uh, this one, ITLB multi -heat. so the ITLB multi is the name of the vulnerability, and uh, uh, this means that uh, we keep the mitigations enabled uh, on the host, uh, uh, except uh, for the one uh, which mitigates ITLB multi -heat. that one we disable it, and we disable it, uh, you can disable it by passing this parameter to the KVM model, Again, one way of doing it is to do it directly at boot time, but you can do it later. And uh, he, at the guest level, uh, we just uh, left them all uh, enabled again. This is the configuration that after various tests and benchmarks uh, proved to be uh, good enough for us, at least for now. Um, yes, so... Final results, let me show you where we uh, were able to get. Then uh, I will give you some more details if there's time. I think there is, uh, I hope there will be time for giving some more details about uh, all the things that I mentioned before. But uh, before that, uh, this is uh, where we managed to, to, to get to. Uh, so basically, the, here in this graph, you see both uh, the uh, numbers that uh, I showed in the first graph, uh, this one is red, so the starting situation, and uh, these uh, uh, others one in green are uh, basically the, the this is basically the performance after the tuning. So um, on average, uh, at the beginning we were uh, losing uh, almost thirty percent as compared to the metal. Uh, funnily enough, with tuning we are even a little bit faster than the metal. Uh, in, uh, in the virtual machine. Of course, this is only average, so, uh, but, but uh, it was a nice touch, I think. Um, uh, the 90 percentile, uh, so basically 90 percent of the tests uh, at the beginning were within a 48 percent performance decline, uh, while with tuning we managed to uh, bring that down to 10 percent. And you can see again uh, here from the graph, if you look at the green bars, so most of them, yeah, there is something uh, beyond 10 percent, but most of them are uh, within that limit. And the max decline, I said uh, that I wanted, uh, that I allow for some outlier, but I don't want uh, them to run as wide as they want. Uh, and in fact, we had uh, pretty bad cases uh, at the beginning. We managed to uh, restrict that to uh, not, not worse than uh, 50, 44 actually, uh, a little bit more than 44% as compared to the metal. So that's what we got with uh, the tuning uh, measures that I showed. As I said, uh, let's try to give into some more details. Uh, I mentioned uh, using, uh, um, uh, using using uh, all the CPUs uh, for the virtual machine instead of uh, reserving some of them to the host. And I said that we tried both configuration. And when we, uh, at least for these workloads, when we tried to uh, reserve uh, when we tried a configuration where we were reserving some of the uh, CPUs to the to the host, uh, then things are worse than uh, yeah okay. 
things are worse than uh, when we uh, instead use all of the CPUs for the VM. These numbers that you see here are um, the comparison between the best solution, so all the VCPUs, the VM has all the VCPUs, and uh, this solution where the VM has less VCPUs because we give some to the host. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's quite, quite a bit worse. Uh, we weren't expecting that. Uh, probably uh, it's the case that uh, the, um, at least this is, these are, yeah, I should say that these are the numbers for uh, the, um, CPU and memory intensive benchmark, and um, apparently the interference uh, that because we still get some interference if we use all the VCP, all the CPUs, but uh, it, it's not uh, too much. Uh, and uh, on the other end, uh, the VM with all the VCPUs is able to the work that we run inside it is able to exploit the additional parallelism. Um, the KVM dedicated. Uh, so disabling those uh, special optimizations and uh, uh, CPU poll. So these are, uh, uh, this is what happens uh, as a difference between not having KVM indicated and instead uh, enabling it. So just uh, uh, enabling uh, that uh, KVM indicated uh, thing in libvirt, which means disabling uh, the optimizations that you typically need, but you don't need them when you do uh, resource partitioning uh, improves uh, the uh, performance uh, quite a bit, especially well on average, but also especially uh, if you look at the uh, 90 percentile. And uh, the same is true a little bit to a lesser extent, but the same is true, I would say, for uh, as soon as you enable CPU adult pool. These again are numbers, uh, the numbers that you get uh, when you compare a configuration without CPU, CPU idle at all, so with this new governor disabled, just not using any uh, governor using the default uh, that you get in the guest. <clears throat> and uh, instead, when well, you enable it, and you get, uh, again, a nice 40% improvement on average, and also the other metric are, uh, yeah, sorry, this is uh, sorry the mismatching the ordering of the, of the lines, but uh, anyway, even the other metrics are improved. Uh, sensibly. Uh, yeah, uh, PCI pass through. PCI pass through instead than um, SRI of V, we tried. Uh, it was um, interesting to try. To be honest, we were expecting maybe even better performance because the VM has access to exactly the same network card as uh, uh, it is seen on the host. Uh, I don't have the performance number for this case. Uh, well, I have, I just don't have it in the slide. Uh, they were worse, and uh, more than that, uh, they were very, very inconsistent. Uh, that's why I don't, uh, I don't have them in the slides, because we have a lot of uh, runs, a lot of experiments with uh, uh, very different, uh, uh, showing very different performance. And uh, what we, we as I said, we couldn't uh, do as much as um, investigation as we wanted. We did some, uh, and we, for example, saw that something was very strange about uh, how Interrupt were 100. So uh, basically, on bare metal, without touching uh, IRQ affinity or anything, I think these graphs are even with, uh, I, I, I have these graphs for both IRQ balance enabled and disabled, and they look pretty much the same. So on bare metal, the, these, are, these are where on the x-axis there are uh, there's the CPUs, so the ID of each CPU. And on the y-axis, there is how, ma how many interrupts from the network card are 100 on each CPU. So on bare metal, uh, the interrupt load is spread uh, across all the CPUs and all the nodes, except node 2, for some reason, which I don't know. In the virtual machine, whatever we do, the interrupts are always under by the first 119 CPUs. And 119 is the number of queues that the uh, network card has. And uh, we try to play a little bit with, uh, as, I said, as I said, interrupt affinity and everything. Uh, we didn't manage to get these to change too much. Then we uh, drop it for now. I hope to be able to investigate this further in the future because it's. Well, um, if I might interrupt here. Yeah. Uh, sure. This card only has 190 interrupt lines. So, yeah. of course, you cannot use more than 190 CPUs. I mean, who should no. load the CPUs? You simply don't have more interrupts. 
No, 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 no. I'm not saying that I'm using more. I'm saying that it's always uh, CPU 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 yeah. until uh, 118. Uh, yeah. I, I cannot get the VM to handle an interrupt of the network card on, on uh, CPU 174, let's say. <laughs> Number affinity? So the net uh, the card per so no the thing is the card per definition is tied to one numa node because the PCI lane runs through this numa node. Trying to assign interrupts to other numa nodes is a bit pointless really because they physically arrive and on that specific numa node. If you get yeah. my get my drift. No, no, I know, I know. So I where know, would I be mean... the point? trying to assign interrupts to an off node uh, to, uh, to another numa node you have to redirect the interrupts then through the entire complex so uh, such that they arrive at the correct node why not leave them there they arrive there anyway yeah um, no i know and in fact we even tried to uh, it's possible to the, to basically uh, have the virtual machine know about the numa affinity and uh, map yeah. the numa affinity in the virtual topology of the virtual machine we tried yeah. that as well point is if you use all the uh, 119 uh, uh, interrupt lines then uh, you have uh, more interrupt lines than uh, how many CPU you have in a NUMA node anyway. And in fact, on bare metal, the, this card is attached to node zero. If, uh, yeah, but to it's, be. again, and on bare metal, we have uh, interrupt, uh, uh, distribu yeah. the interrupt node distributed uh, in this way, which uh, cause a different interference pattern with the workload which is running on on on, on these yeah. CPUs with respect yeah, to the So VM. this is something, uh, as yes. I said, so don't, 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 so. Um, <laughs> Having more interrupt lines than you have CPUs is pretty much pointless. Having more interrupt lines than your complex where the node, where the PCI device is attached to, has is also, well, doubtful to say the very least, because then you have to physically route interrupts to a different complex going through the NUMA interlink, which will cost performance and really doesn't buy you anything because um, you're not even loading. If you have more than well 60, 60 lanes into that device, you, you're not able to load all of these efficiently. You're far better off reducing the number of, of queues and then ensure that these queues are correctly assigned and, and attached to the correct CPUs. That will give you a far better performance than just using as much queues as you, as you have. Yeah, um, makes sense. Uh, it still puzzled me, puzzles me why uh, bare metal and uh, virtualization keys were so different, but uh, I totally understand that uh, we, we, yeah, what you said about, uh, uh, for yeah. example, limiting the number of queues. And in fact, with SRAOV, which only exposes to the VM only four queues, we get better results than these, for example. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. So the less, less, less queues actually will give you better results. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I can skip. Uh, and uh, yeah, the last thing, the last, uh, easy, the last Have thing, you yeah. tested cache insecure? <laughs> cache unsafe, yeah, I, I pro we probably should. We, we want to test more cache configurations because uh, this is a, in, in this benchmark, which is a network intensive, uses also disk, but mostly for writing, writing logs or stuff like that. We mentioned that we, sorry, we saw that uh, cache equal to none was a lot better than uh, the default, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, right back in this case. So we haven't had the time yet to uh, check other uh, cache configurations. And uh, I don't know why um, none has a, so much better performance than while back. It's also another interesting point that I wanted to mention here, but uh, only as something that we plan to uh, invest, do some more investigations on. Oh, and uh, the speculative execution vulnerability mitigations. Um, I mentioned uh, disabling only ITB multi hit. The numbers that you see here is, uh, for example, this is the comparison between having uh, all the mitigations on uh, host and guest and only having. Uh, Mm, and sorry, having all the mitigations off at the host level. So ITB multi hit is there, but also a lot of others. Below here, you see the actual configuration that we use. So at the host level, we keep everything on and we disable only ITB multi hit. And you see that the numbers are pretty much the same. So it means that uh, uh, almost the entire uh, uh, performance penalty that we pay for uh, host level mitigation 
comes from uh, uh, IFAB Mobility, which I guess means that this workload is very sensitive to uh, any kind of huge pages, and we absolutely need them in order to for, for it to behave well. And the very last thing, uh, if you notice this inside, if you notice that this inside the VM um, vulnerability output when I show the slide, we see that the one TF is vulnerable in is marked as vulnerable in the VM, uh, which is a little bit weird because I would expect to see the bare metal part of the <clears throat> of the mitigation output here, like um, uh, PTA inversion, PTA inversion, but I don't because, uh, as a matter of fact, by default, uh, our uh, guest, uh, if you check with the CPU, has 42 bits, while the host has 46 bits. And if you check EA20 memory map, you see that there is uh, memory put uh, um, beyond uh, uh, max physical address bit divided by two. So this is uh, probably not a big deal and not really for not matter for doesn't really matter for performance, I think. Uh, but it was annoying because the VM shows this uh, L1TF system, uh, this, this message in the message. So system has more than uh, must be a uh, by two divided by two. So the L1TF, L1TF mitigation is not effective. So in order to deal with that, uh, there is no clear way to do it in libvirt currently, and you have to do this kind of aki uh, passing of QMU parameter directly. And uh, yeah, that's it. The final results is it's, it's exactly the same as before. So I won't spend time on it because I don't have any longer and I don't have any more time, I think. And these are uh, information and contact information about us, about me and Lee, and I'm done. I'm not sure whether there's time of, there's any time of more for more questions than, than the one than what was asked uh, online. Uh, sorry about that, if that's the case. Yeah, I, I think there there was one question I've noticed about uh, like if you have some uh, idea about minus sixty percent, like so sixty percent improvement essentially in the guest in compared to host. Like uh, I think Michal Kuni was asking that. Yeah. Well, like uh, which uh, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm seeing if I can. Yeah, it's, okay. Uh, yeah, please. It is about also on this slide, or as I understood that uh, the green bars uh, at the minus 60 means that the uh, virtual workload was 60% uh, quicker than the bare metal, like on the uh, far left. Where's, where's the minus, minus 60? Is it, is it this uh, line, sorry, or not? Uh, yes, yeah, slide uh, 38. OK. So it's this one. The only minus here is uh, the average uh, performance decline between uh, the VM and bare metal, which is minus three, which oh. means that in the average, graph, uh, in the graph, you know, there is a bar which ah. is at minus. Ah, yes, so yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I see what you, I see what you mean. Yes, uh, that's the benchmark. Uh, the benchmark is um, not super stable uh, itself. Uh, if I show you, I don't have it here, but if I show you um, two runs, uh, for example, both done on bare metal with the same exact configuration, there will be some plus uh, minus 60 or uh, plus uh, 55 or stuff like that. So that's why uh, we care about uh, average, but also percentile, but also max decline because uh, two different runs of this benchmark uh, may uh, give uh, <laughs> different results, even if the conditions are the same. So yes, in this case, there were some of the tests where the VM was 60% uh, faster than bare metal. But I can show you tests where bare metal is 60% faster or 70% slower by itself. Uh, uh, thank you. It's clear now. <laughs>